the Acolyte, Episode 5, Night. Oh boy, these episode titles seriously lack inspiration, am I right? So, uh, after waking up from getting force pushed, Osha witnesses the Mystery Sith kill all of the Jedi one by one, with the exception of Yord, who does help hold them off back a bit. However, the likes of Jeki and Sol are strangely nowhere to be seen. And I think if lightsaber battles are your most favorite thing in Star Wars, then uh, this episode should be a real treat for you. Because to see this Sith solo an entire group of Jedi is both impressive and entertaining. Well, certainly the most entertaining thing that we've seen from this show to date, that's for sure. Even seeing the way that this Sith fights is interesting, especially as he makes the Jedi attack his gauntlet and helmet, which normally would be crazy, but uh, not so much the case here. As it turns out that each time a lightsaber hits his helmet and gauntlet, it temporarily shorts out the Jedi's lightsaber blades, thus making it easier for the Sith to wipe them out one by one. As for how he's doing this, I can only guess that his gauntlet and helmet are likely forged from Kartosis, as that's really the only logical explanation that I can surmise with all of the Jedi lightsabers just shutting off like that each time they come in contact with those parts. But with Yord being the last one left and just about to die, Osha tries helping him by stunning the Sith with her blaster. And strangely enough, for whatever reason, it does not affect him whatsoever. And this then leads him to try and go after her, ignoring Yord. However, when he does do that, Sol shows up from god knows where he's been this entire time to save Osha from the Sith, and then demands that he reveal his identity. But the Sith claims that he has already met Sol and then vanishes into the forest. Elsewhere, Jeki, just like Sol, jumps into the scene from wherever she's been hiding and captures Mei, who in turn struggles against being arrested? Wait, hold on. Didn't Mei literally want to turn herself into the Jedi last episode? So why is she trying to put up a fight here? Not to mention, where was Jeki this entire time when the Sith was killing all of her Jedi friends? Was she hiding in a bush with soul somewhere? I, I don't know. Anyway, the Sith also arrives on the scene and distracts Jeki, allowing Mei to escape. And this then presents us the second solo duel of the episode, and it's also another good one. That said, I do find it somewhat hard to believe that Jeki, the only Padawan in Soul's group, manage to outlive all of the other Jedi and actually put up a decent fight against the Sith. Although, then again, I suppose it only tells us of just how awful those Jedi Masters and Knights must have been at dueling that they were all outshone by a Padawan and got killed despite having an 8-man advantage over the Sith. Still, the Sith does get the better hand here over Jeki, but rather than finishing her off, he, yeah, you guessed it, disappears into the darkness just like that. And I gotta say it, there are already way too many awkward conveniences like this here. First, Sol disappears, then he reappears, then Jeki disappears, and then she reappears. And now the Sif appears, disappears, appears, and disappears again. <sighs> All without any logic whatsoever. It's like I'm watching some kind of magic act instead of a lightsaber duel. It really is ridiculous if you think about it. The Sith later ends up finding Mei and tries to kill her for wanting to betray him. However, before he can do that, both Jeki and Sol appear at the same time and team up on him. And Jeki once again impresses with her ability in grit, knocking off the Sith's helmet, and basically at that point forcing him to take things to the next level and going dual wielding lightsabers. Which while cool, it also sees him finish Jeki off. And it's also at this moment that we get to see who the Sith behind the mask was. 
revealing him to be none other than Kimir. Which, eh, I'm kind of mixed about this. On one hand, I'm relieved because it easily could have been, you know, an actual stupid choice like turning Carl into the mystery Sith. But at the same time, I'm disappointed because they made Kimir being the Sith way too obvious. So obvious that I thought it just couldn't have been true, that like that they were maybe just doing all that to throw us off, but really, no. I guess I gave the writers too much credit on that. Regardless, eh, at the end of the day, I'm fine with Kimir being the Sith, and I especially like how he changes personas when speaking to Mei basically doing exactly what Palpatine did in the prequels until he had to reveal himself to the Jedi as well. I actually even really like how Kamir mocks Mei for being stupid enough to not pick up on all of the obvious clues that he was her Sith mystery master. And well, uh, yeah, he ain't wrong. Mei's clearly not the sharpest tool in the shed. After openly claiming to be a Sith to Sol, He's then questioned about what his intentions are and why he risked discovery. And well, I've got a few things to say about this scene. Firstly, Kamir says that he needs to kill Mei because she exposed him. Uh, wait, how so? Not only did she not know he was her Sith master, but she probably didn't even know he was a Sith either in the first place based on her past dialogue with him. And as well, like we just established, uh, Mei isn't too bright either. Uh, she's 10 cents short of a dime. Secondly, Kamir says that he has no name, which is odd seeing as he's a Sith Lord. He'd have at least his very own Sith name, right? Unless he's called like Darth No Name or something like that. But nah, I'm still pretty sure he's Darth Venomous until proven otherwise. But again, it's weird why he wouldn't just say so if he knew he was gonna kill Sol off anyway, as why be so secretive about your name at that point? Then again, perhaps my second theory about him not being a Banite Sith is true instead. And maybe he's more of a self-taught Sith and never gave himself a Sith name. Hmm, well that could be possible too, I suppose. As for when he's asked about why he risked discovery, his smirky answer that he kind of didn't because he wore a helmet is funny, I'll give him that. But it's also a sarcastic one and with Kamir not really answering the question either, it still begs the question why did he decide to reveal himself right now and here of all places. Not to mention, he also says that one of the main reasons he wears the mask is so Soul can't read his mind. Which, well, uh, brings me back to one of my main criticisms in Episode 2 when Soul and the Jedi do interrogate Kamir in his shop. Where at the time I complained in my review why Soul was only asking him questions when he could just as easily read his mind and found out that he's a Sith there and then. I mean, Kamir literally even tells Soul in that exact scene not to wipe his memory too. Yet, because of the bad writing, Soul didn't act back then. Because if he did, then, well, uh, this show wouldn't have this uh, meh reveal in episode 5. Which, again, should not have surprised anyone that Kamir is the Sith. Furthermore, back on the topic of the helmet, but Kamir says he needs to wear the helmet to stop Sol from reading his mind, right? Yet, when his helmet is off the entire time afterwards when Jeki knocks it off, then why doesn't Sol just read his mind then? He could have just as easily been reading it this entire time when questioning Kamir, but doesn't. Eh, I guess the writers forgot about this little tidbit that was mentioned not even a minute ago. Lastly, and I'll admit this part is a nitpick, but what happens to Kamir's black neck seal once he loses his helmet? Pretty sure we don't see him ever remove it physically, so it just magically disappeared too, I suppose? Okay. Now, Kamir does mention and hint about knowing something about Soul's past, which may be dark, and perhaps pertaining to the events in Episode 3. 
Which, that does sound somewhat intriguing, but also makes me wonder how Kamir would even know about that. I can only assume right now that he knows how to read minds as well and maybe read Maze. I don't know what exactly that's about, but I'm sure we're gonna find out very soon. Elsewhere in the forest, Osha tells Yord that they need to go back for Sol, otherwise he'll die. With Yord realizing that, hey, yeah, she's got a point and agrees to return. But it's also during this scene that Osha notices the Umber Moths floating around and has an idea. She then tells Yord to turn his saber off because the light attracts them and this confuses him? And my question here is, how? As last episode, it was either Yord or one of the other Jedi that tells Osha and everyone else that the light attracts Umber Moths. Yet, somehow this episode, Yord already seemed to forget this exact information? How? Osha learned this information the exact same time he did. <laughs> I mean, I like Yord and all, but this guy is dumb as bricks. And I can't decide whether that's intentional or if the writers once again forgot about something that they wrote beforehand. Which sadly has been a reoccurring theme in this show. When they do return back for Seoul, Yord attempts to ambush Kamir. But unfortunately, he's quickly killed off and in a brutal and humiliating way by having his neck snapped off. Seeing this happen, Sol fights Kamir again and manages to overpower him this time, but is soon then stopped from killing him by Osha. She instead has her own idea and plants a light on Kamir that causes the Umber Moths to attack him and then carry him off to wherever. And wait, hold on again. You're telling me that Kamir is this untouchable, badass Sith that can kill an entire group of experienced Jedi Knights in seconds, yet he somehow conveniently misses Osha inches away from him with his lightsaber swing. Not to mention, how is it that he didn't even sense Osha come up behind him and stop her? Yet he was fully able to do exactly this to Mei at the end of episode 2 who, well, let's face it, is a far better fighter than Osha. Plus, how is it exactly that he struggles more with a bunch of bugs than actual Jedi Knights too? Eh, eh, once again, some real inconsistent writing at play here. Yikes. With Kamir out of the picture for now, Mei uses Osha's stun gun on Sol so she can speak with Osha privately. Wait... You're telling me that the stun gun suddenly now works? It certainly didn't on Kamir just like 10 minutes ago, but yet it does on Sol, who seems to be stronger than him? Uh, okay then? Mei and Osha afterwards end up arguing about each other's choices in life, with Mei not even explaining anything or bothering to defend her own actions to then get frustrated and use the force to knock Osha unconscious. Things really then get weird here as Mei begins to steal Osha's clothes in order to pose as her twin sister when returning to Seoul, who doesn't really notice anything and takes her back to his ship, along with the suspicious Basil who is actually noticing something unlike Seoul for them all to leave Kafar and return back home to Coruscant. Okay, cool, but uh, I've got questions. Last episode, Mei said that she changed her mind, right? And that she no longer wants to kill the Jedi, but instead turn herself in. Yet now, suddenly it seems that she changed her mind again, where she's assumingly going undercover because she now wants to kill the Jedi all over again. <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty sure she's not gonna turn herself into Soul either, as uh, she could have done this long before setting foot on the Jedi shuttle with him. Nor did she even need to play dress up and pretend that she's Osha. To add to that, Mei says how much she loves Osha and how loyal she is to her and all of that jazz. 
yet ends up leaving her all passed out with an open wound, no less, near some corpses on a dangerous alien jungle planet where Kamir could get to her and kill her. Not to mention some wild animal or giant bug for that matter. Yeah, just goes to show what kind of kind and considerate sister she is. So much for her loyalty to Hosha. And to add to that, how in the world can't Sol also not sense the dark side at all in the fake Osha? Or even tell that something in her behavior is off? Or, you know, spot the witch tattoo on Mei's forehead that's been clearly visible this entire time? It's not even a normal tattoo either, it's like a shiny, somewhat sparkly tattoo, it sticks out. Besides, I'm pretty sure it's a long trek too, at least a couple of hours for them to hike back to the Jedi ship. And you're telling me that in all those hours, Sol and Mei didn't speak a word with one another? Yeah, right, I ain't buying it. I mean, Kamir back in episode 2 didn't even know Osha and in less than a minute could tell that she wasn't Mei, so what gives here? We then end the episode with Kamir freeing himself from the bugs and comes across the unconscious Osha. It then looks like he force heals her wound and picks her up, which we can only assume with the intention of now making Osha become his new acolyte. But hold on, how does Kamir even manage to heal Osha's wound like that? As since when do the Sith know how to do force healing? Uh, like I said since episode 2, there seems to be a lot more to this Kamir guy than he's letting on. Overall, I think it's not a groundbreaking opinion by any means to say that this was by far the best episode of the Acolyte to date. It's a good episode for the most part, but that's really only based on the Jedi and Sith action alone, which hands down has the best lightsaber choreography that we've seen in a Disney Plus show. But having said that, at the same time, it still objectively has a lot of problems, with bad writing still being very prevalent here. Which, well, what can I say, again detracts from the overall enjoyment of the show. Not to mention, even though I like Kamir and now with Yord gone, I'd say he's my favorite character of the show thus far. But if I'm being honest here, he's kind of an awful Sith Lord during this era. Sure, he reveals himself as a Sith to all of the Jedi, and that's fine and dandy, only if he's sure that he can kill everyone and leave no witnesses. But instead, he ends up being dragged away by some bugs, letting Mei, Osha, Sol, and Basil to all survive. And this oversight is critical. As for all he knows, Mei was to still turn herself into the Jedi and tell them all about him, as well as Sol confirming that he did fight a Sith. Thus, Kamir's failure jeopardizes the very secrecy of the Sith's existence as we know it. But hey, luckily for him, the bad writing on this show is his ally. And that was my take on this episode of The Acolyte. Let me know what you all thought about this episode in the comments below, and if you haven't already, remember to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you on the next one.